Hello, thank you for joining us for Unite for Sites webinar about tools for designing and implementing effective programs. My name is Jennifer Staple Clark and I'm founder and chief executive officer of Unite for Site. I'll briefly introduce you to Unite for Site, review the webinar logistics, and then we'll hear from our six expert panelists. Unite for Site is a global health nonprofit organization that promotes high quality care for all. And we offer extensive global health and social entrepreneurship education programs. Our Global Health University program, for example, offers this free webinar series, including today's webinar, and we additionally offer 20 online certificate programs for students and professionals, and many students receive academic credit for completion of our certificates through their own university. The certificate topics range from a certificate in global health and a certificate in global health research to a certificate in social entrepreneurship. We have another webinar coming up next Thursday as well during February about the strategies for responsible global health engagement. And we'll have other webinars during the spring as well. And we encourage you to register for these free upcoming webinars at uniteforsite.org slash webinars. Additional educational opportunities for students and professionals include participation in Unite for Sites annual global health and social entrepreneurship events which focus on responsible global engagement. Our 12th annual Global Health and Innovation Conference, which is the world's largest global health and social entrepreneurship conference, is coming up on March 28th and 29th, 2015 at Yale University. And the conference actually newly includes this year a GHIC Innovation Prize, which is a $10,000 and a $5,000 cash prize that will be awarded to the two best social enterprise pitches that are presented during the 2015 conference. Both students and professionals and both nonprofit and for-profit organizations are eligible to apply for the GHIC Innovation Prize. And the Innovation Prize supports outstanding early stage and startup ideas, programs, and organizations which are locally developed and locally responsible. We also have healthcare delivery programs that provide care to patients living in extreme poverty. We partner with phenomenal local eye clinics in Ghana, Honduras, and India to provide quality eye care to patients who are otherwise unable to access or afford care. And these programs are locally led and locally managed by the local medical professionals. And our collaboration has provided eye care to 1.9 million people by the local doctors during the past decade, including more than 87,000 site-restoring surgeries by those local ophthalmologists. And Unite for Sight is the world's only organization that is a healthcare delivery organization that also offers immersive global health education and social entrepreneurship opportunities for students and professionals. Participants support and learn from the local doctors in Ghana, Honduras, and India as they provide care to patients living in extreme poverty in villages, slums, and refugee camps. And the participants then learn from those local medical professionals about patient barriers to care and about effective strategies to reach the hardest to reach patients who are otherwise unable to access or afford care. And the local doctors are incredible social entrepreneurs who design effective and innovative strategies to eliminate patient barriers to care. Now I'll describe the basic logistics of this webinar, and we're so delighted to have all of you with us today. We have six incredible panelists, and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this next hour. Each panelist will start by giving a two-minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their key piece of guidance about designing and implementing effective programs. And then we'll dedicate the remaining time to your questions and answers. We received many stellar questions already submitted from you, our audience, by Tuesday's question submission deadline. And we selected the most common and most thoughtful questions to ask our panelists. We also invite you today to submit additional questions in the text box on the left of your webinar screen. And then we'll select those questions to ask the panelists today as well. We also encourage you to tweet about the webinar, including your key lessons learned by using the hashtag GHUWebinar, and you can see that hashtag in the webinar visuals on your screen. We'll proceed now with having our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order. I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, Julie Anathan. Julie, please begin by introducing yourself, your background and current role, and please share your key guidance about designing and implementing effective programs. 
Hi, Jennifer. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate uh, in this wonderful webinar. So, yes, my name is Julie Anathan. Um, I am the Deputy Chief Nursing Officer for Seed Global Health. Uh, we are an NGO that's based out of Boston. We strive to improve the health education and delivery in places facing a dire shortage of health professionals by working with in-country partners to meet their long-term health care human resource needs. Our signature program, the Global Health Service Partnership, GHSP, is a unique public-private partnership between Seed Global Health, the U.S. Peace Corps, and PEPFAR. In collaboration with our host country governments and training institutions, GHSP sends U.S. physicians, nurses, midwives, as volunteer educators for one year to medical and nursing schools in Malawi, Tanzania, and Uganda. Seed Global Health raises and offers $30,000 in debt repayment to each volunteer to help, help offset financial barriers such as medical and nursing school loans that may prevent them from service. We have just completed our third recruitment season and are in the process now of matching our applicants with the expertise and the needs identified by our partner medical and nursing institutions. So as I've mentioned, uh, my background is in nursing. Um, I felt compelled to work in global health and global health nursing specifically after traveling abroad and witnessing the challenges that nurses faced within limited resource environments. I was a nurse for many years before I pursued my MPH at Boston University, and this really opened the door to where I am now. In terms of lessons learned, um, I really believe that, that the partnerships, uh, collaboration, and especially listening are key to long-term success. Before making any decisions, we really need to understand the implications for our partners and bring them to the table and listen. And I also want to remind us all that nurses make up 60 to 80 percent of the healthcare workforce and provide up to 90 percent of healthcare services. Effective programs in global health are those that include nurses in their designing and their implementation process. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. And Dean Sikon, if you can also please introduce yourself. Certainly. My name is Dean Sikon. I'm the founder and CEO of Dean's Beans Organic Coffee, a for-profit coffee importer and roaster here in Massachusetts. I started Dean's Beans 21 years ago because I was unsatisfied with the structure of um, non-government organizations, development organizations in the coffee lands around the world. My background is I'm an indigenous rights and environmental lawyer and a business lawyer, so I had a wide spread of uh, background to create a business. I started, uh, I'm the co-founder of Coffee Kids, the first nonprofit organization in coffee, and after six years of Coffee Kids, uh, although I was still involved with it, I realized that nothing was really changing on the local level and until businesses change their fundamental operating principles in, in sourcing in the developing South, um, nothing was going to change for all the good work we were doing. So I created Dean's Beans as a vehicle, using coffee as a vehicle for social, economic, and environmental change at the Global South source using the business itself as the vehicle, and we're the only company that does that. So what that means is in every village we work in, besides advocacy and activism, we also do um, people-centered development projects, co-designed with the folks in the villages, all the farmers and their families, and managed by the farmers. And uh, the takeaway I would have, and many of our programs are 10 years, 15 years old and running strong. The biggest takeaway I would share is that anybody working in partnership with anybody in the Global South has to get out of the way and recognize that if it's going to be a true partnership, we're not the experts, we're the providers of resources and facilitation, but if a, if a program is going to have legs in the community, the buy-in must be strong by local folks, and that means they need to be involved in management and be able to take over the program long after you're gone, not just during a three-year cycle that you're there. I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Thank you, Dean. And Shin Damio, if you can also please introduce yourself. Sure, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shin Daimyo. I am the Clinical Program Officer uh, for Partners in Health. We are an international NGO and social justice organization. We're um, working in over now, I believe, 10 countries around the world, uh, providing health care to the poorest of the poor in some of the most rural areas in the world uh, that include Haiti, Rwanda, Lesotho, uh, Malawi, and Russia. 
Um, in my role at Partners in Health, I mainly manage and develop our mental health programs across all of our sites. I also provide uh, senior guidance and technical assistance to a lot of our clinical and programmatic leadership in the areas of program development, program management, uh, and evaluation. Um, my own background, I, I'm originally an immigrant. Um, both my parents are immigrants. My mother was a boat person uh, during the Vietnam War and growing up in Los Angeles was really exposed to the inequities and lack of access to health care, um, which really motivated me a lot when I went to college and started to really seek out those sort of social justice opportunities. Um, I worked in the Navajo Nation, also worked in uh, South Central Los Angeles, really looking at the inequities in mental health care and access, and I've been really transitioning to the global health um, world and global mental health area as I started to see a lot of the vulnerabilities and what that really meant on a global scale when particularly linked to poverty. Um, some of my background includes working during the, the Tohoku earthquake and Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan uh, with internally displaced farmers. Uh, I've also provided consultation to develop uh, global mental health systems in the public sector in Pakistan, uh, India, and Sierra Leone. Um, and the key piece of guidance that I would give, again, really relates to a very strong relationship with the public sector and really being able to define local needs through the very mouths of those who are there. So really echoing uh, what Dean was saying, really taking the expertise, really taking the priorities um, from a lot of our local partners and have them drive the conversation as to what really needs to happen. Um, and having a very strong focus on local capacity building, both in the short term and the long term for any program that you're really implementing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shin. And Rachel Glenister, if you could also please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rachel Glenister. I'm Executive Director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT or known as JPAL. Uh, we are a network of over 100 researchers doing randomized trials, uh, looking at social outcomes, uh, so in health, but also governance and women's empowerment and all sorts of different issues. Um, and uh, so I personally have worked a lot in Sierra Leone. I'm doing work in in Pakistan and Bangladesh at the moment as well, and I've worked in India. Uh, in terms of advice, I, um, a lot of people have talked about the importance of working closely with local partners and, uh, and I think that's absolutely critical, but as other people have talked about it, I will focus on another aspect, which is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel and learn from the evidence around you. And that evidence comes in many forms, including the conversations with local partners, but also, uh, you know, other more quantitative evidence. Um, and, one very specific piece of advice is that a lot of people think that the route to scale is in health is through uh, sustainability and therefore through charging. And I caution that that often actually undermines a lot of preventative healthcare programs because even very small costs can really deter people uh, from participating. And if you want to reach scale, sometimes finding alternative methods um, to to produce uh, preventative healthcare that's free and easily accessible is actually a better way to scale. So it sounds counterintuitive, but that's come out of a lot of our work. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel. And Laura Herman, please introduce yourself as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's Laura Herman. I'm with FSG. Um, we are a social enterprise, and we work with a range of actors across the social sector to really reimagine social change. So we work with corporations, foundations, nonprofits. Um, we think about our own impact, both through our consulting work and also as field builders. So we also try to identify big patterns in our work and write about them and make them accessible to the field more broadly. Here's and global development projects, and that takes the form of sort of designing strategies or for achieving a set of outcomes, uh, designing measurement frameworks, or conducting evaluations. And uh, it's getting harder and harder to be super original here in terms of um, advice. But I would build mm. off of, I agree with so much of what has been said, and just to build off of Rachel's comment, you know, I think um, taking the time up front to really invest in 
research and outreach to ensure a strong strategic underpinning for any program um, is very, very critical. And I'll talk more about dimensions of that, but I think it is an investment, um, one that is sometimes hard to make, but both to ensure um, the important partnerships that are, are eager and ready to go with you, as Julie mentioned, and others. Um, I think that, that on-the-ground research up front is just time very, very well spent, and uh, I think also a, a good part of the recipe for ensuring funding for, <laughs> for some of those programs. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. And our final panelist, Anna McCullough, if you can also please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna McCullough. I am the co-founder and CEO of QuestBridge, which is a national educational nonprofit organization, so I'm sort of an outlier in that I don't, we don't actually focus on health care, but we do work with um, low-income populations here in the U.S. QuestBridge recruits, develops, and supports talented youth from low-income backgrounds beginning in high school and continuing through college in their first job. And our goal is really to prepare them for success at America's best institutions so they'll eventually become leaders in their own communities, companies, and, and nationally and globally. QuestBridge has gone through a number of important changes in its history, including starting from a very small residential summer plus five-year mentorship program for a small number, about 20 students every year at Stanford University. Um, today we're partnered with 35 colleges and serve thousands of students every year. They're all low income and the vast majority are in the first generation to college. Um, our partners include schools like Yale and Stanford and Princeton and MIT and Amherst and Vanderbilt, um, and they actually use our QuestBridge application to um, help them find and recruit exceptional talent. Um, just a little bit more about our outcomes. Last, last year we placed around 2,000 students into our partner colleges, again, all on excellent financial aid. And then when the students are in college, we do quite a bit of work with them through our Quest Scholars Network, which is um, on every campus, a sort of chapter community of peers for the students. In terms of my own background, I um, founded QuestBridge actually, excuse me, actually when I was in college with my then boyfriend, now husband, Michael McCullough. Um, we, um, I have an undergraduate degree in human biology and a law degree from Stanford, um, and I've worked as CEO of QuestBridge as well as a management consultant and a founder and VP of a Silicon Valley-based educational startup company. So my piece of advice perhaps comes from all of those various experiences, and I would say that one thing I learned is to do a lot of thoughtful design, and I, I agree very much with the folks who said that research and kind of learning from, you know, learning on the ground is really important. And then I would say that once you feel confident with that, to actually start implementing pretty quickly in the sense that we, we're sort of big fans of pilot programs because we find and we have found that if you wait too long to implement, you may not actually get a lot of the learning that you do just by doing. Terrific. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you to all of our phenomenal panelists. As you heard, they have a wealth of expertise and guidance to share with you today. Now we'll proceed with the question and answer session. As mentioned at the start, we received questions in advance from you, our audience members, and those are in our question queue today. If you have additional questions, please post them in the text box on the left of your webinar screen, and we will include additional questions as well. Our first question is for Julie. What are Seed Global Health's key lessons for building local capacity in resource-poor settings? Uh, thank you. That's such a good question. Um, so, you know, in June we will be ending our second cohort uh, of GS GHSP volunteers, and we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. Um, you know, certainly as I mentioned, uh, honoring and listening to our partners uh, with the Peace Corps, Ministries of Health, Ministries of Education, deans, faculty, students, um, really valuing uh, the voice and perspective and strength that each partner brings to the work that we're all doing together. Um, uh, without really asking our partner institutions, for example, what their needs are for the following academic year, we may end up sending them the wrong volunteer who holds the clinical expertise that they can't utilize. Um, and that really frustrates everyone involved um, and stagnates any potential of capacity building. Um, secondly, certainly understanding the cultures and the health systems in which we're working uh, as best as we can. Uh, the environments in which our volunteers work and live are very different from our own and can be incredibly complex. 
uh, we encourage them to take time in the beginning to observe and build relationships to garner a better understanding really of the landscape uh, in which they'll be living and working. Um, you know, there might be a very frustrating situation, but this quickly can give way to compassion uh, when we sort of take time to understand and, um, you know, look at the economic, social, political differences and challenges uh, that might be influencing our efforts um, and really approach it with creativity uh, and adapt our efforts accordingly to be more effective in our teaching and programmatic efforts. Um, and um, last but not least, probably, uh, you know, certainly the long-term commitment. Uh, we feel strongly that our commitment to the academic sites gets stronger over time, and this is essential to relationship building and growing capacity. Um, the difference between the first year and second year at our sites was remarkable. Uh, while we had incredible success the first year, we had 30 volunteers uh, training, I think over 2,800 trainees, teaching 85 courses, uh, during the second year, our 44 volunteers have had a much easier time integrating into their sites, and the training institutions really seem to have um, been able to utilize the volunteers much more effectively. Uh, so we're really excited to evaluate the outcomes for this year uh, to see what seems to have made, been made possible through a continued co commitment uh, and continued partnership. And over a long-term commitment, additionally, uh, this allows us to monitor and evaluate the outcomes of the program. Uh, as well as the voice and opinions of our partners. So those are three key lessons. Excellent. Thank you, Julie. And Anna, how does an organization best transition, best transition from the design phase to the funding and implementation stage? Yeah, so um, I sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I am generally a fan of, you know, once you once you think you have a solid theory of change and a, a kind of a point of view and a thesis about what you'd like to do, I really believe that getting started as soon as possible um, makes a lot of sense. So obviously you have to research enough to be responsible and to make sure that you're serving your population, but there's so many things about implementation that you only learn when you're implementing. So, um, you know, QuestBridge is actually over 20 years old now, and um, we made plenty of mistakes on, through, through the process of growing, and we actually, at the beginning, were a very different program, as I mentioned earlier. So we, we d the model that we have today it was, is very much sort of an iteration and, and a bunch of pivots uh, from the starting point that we, um, from when we, when we first began. And so I think that, um, well, at the, when we first began, we had the belief that there were thousands of students in America who actually were bright enough and had, had the right um, kind of academic and personal qualifications to do well in our best colleges in the, in the country. Um, we started with a very small <coughs> model um, that was really different. And so um, as we built and grew that model, we realized over time that QuestBridge, the current model, was the way we could scale. But we never started our little program thinking we were going to be QuestBridge today. So I would say, you know, the sooner you can start to, to get your feet wet and start making mistakes, um, learning and iterating. And, you know, we had a lot of failures <laughs> before we hit our successful model. Um, so kind of learn by doing, basically. Terrific. Thank you, Anna. And Dean, if you could start over with transitioning from concept to successful enterprise, what would you now do differently based on your lessons learned? Uh, I wish that, I thought that was going to be the third question, but we'll we'll jump right into that because um, you asked. Yeah, I I think that um, I think that it's interesting to hear Anna talk about the evolution of model because you know when I started doing business as a vehicle itself for social change, and basically the Boston Globe called us a, a miniature development organization because of the way we work. Um, I think, I wish I had brought more people on earlier um, as resources allowed. I think, I think we, we jealously guarded um, this precious thing that we had, and that didn't allow us to... Um, to grow, I, I'm, I'm not interested in growth per se, but it didn't allow us to grow as an organization enough to have a deep enough staff to um, to manage everything that came our way over the over the following years. And I'm still in that situation now, and it's very very difficult for me to find really good folks who 
um, not only have talent to do uh, various forms of development work from women's you know, overseeing it from 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 women's empowerment to over, men overcoming gender violence to loan funds to wells, all the things we're involved in. It's hard enough to find people with that kind of talent, but it's harder to find people, especially I, I don't know who's listening to this, but I'll say it. Uh, especially to find people of uh, you know in their late twenties, early thirties, who don't think that they have all the answers and are willing to just be humble and learn. Um, I, we've had some bad experiences, I'd say, over time with folks coming in here and letting them loose in in our source communities, and uh, they just uh, they just get the kind of white savior complex, even though you, you you think you don't have it. It's amazing how many people still think that we're the experts. So um, I wish I had brought more people on and, and taken more time to mentor them in in sort of the, the social justice platform that we have here or the model that we use. So here we are 21, 22 years into it, and I'm finally starting to get it right. <laughs> so I think it's a long-scale evolution. I, that, that's, that's the only thing I can say on that. Fantastic. Thank you, Dean, for your insight. And Rachel, what examples have you seen of programs which failed or were later proven to have caused harm because the intervention didn't focus on evidence-based or outcomes-focused design and implementation, and what should have been done differently from the onset? Right. I just have to say something about the um, the, the problems of uh, people uh, going in and thinking they have all the answers uh, uh, and not listening to those around them. Uh, we've faced exactly the same problem, and it's absolutely critical uh, to avoid this white savior complex that was discussed. Anyway, on um, on the issue of projects that have not worked or programs that have not worked, I think a good example is a very early randomized evaluation done by economists in Kenya of textbooks. And they were obviously, you know, a lot of countries, a lot of organizations see poor uh, schools in poor countries and see that they don't have much equipment and much they textbooks and they invest in, in um, you know, getting more textbooks. And these were government of Kenya textbooks, approved textbooks. And there were very few in the classes. And they evaluated the impact of having more textbooks. And they found that it actually had no impact on most children uh, in the classes. And it, it was quite interesting to see why, because they found that the textbooks were just at way too high a level for the kids in these poor rural schools to follow them. And so the textbooks actually helped the very top of the class who were performing well at the beginning, but the textbooks were just, you know, completely at the wrong level. And this has then been found sort of similar approaches uh, and the need to focus things on the level of the child, you know, that is the most promising way to improve education. And I think the failure there, and it really, you know, pointed to a deep failure in how education in Kenya was run, because as I say, this, these were government textbooks, um, is that it was a lack of tailoring to the, you know, to the level, to the need of the local population. So people just went in and assumed, well, you know, the people who wrote the textbooks, I'm sure their kids, you know, it was perfectly fine level for them, but it was a failure to sort of really evaluate what the needs were on the ground. Um, and the needs and the level of learning was, was very different. And this is something that we see again and again. People come in to solve a, a problem when they don't really understand the problem to start with. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. And Laura, what are some common pitfalls to program design and development, and how can programs and organizations best avoid these types of pitfalls? Yeah, so this um, is a nice thread through these, I guess. Uh, you know, I'll pick up on some of these ideas that, you know, of course a, a pitfall is not sort of knowing <laughs> what you're doing or that it's kind of strategically sound. And I think there are, um, even if you sort of do the research, I think, so assuming uh, the time is spent and, and the research is done and the partners have been consulted and, and all of the things that others have already mentioned, I think at the end of the day, a lot of the problems folks are trying to solve are very complex. And the strategies and the theories 
are relatively simplistic, right? They're very linear frequently. And they don't allow for feedback loops. So building on the point of the importance of pilots or prototypes, how do you, what, what's so important is, is really thinking through um, the assumptions that underlie that strategy, what data can be collected cheaply and in a timely manner to test those assumptions once you're underway so that you can really proactively, strategically course correct um, at the earliest moment, right, not waiting for the five-year evaluation. And so, so certainly, you know, one way I think that um, programs, you know, can be especially these complex ones and anything new, right, is that they, they really build in some systems um, and feedback loops for learning along the way. Another, a second um, common pitfall, I think, is sort of assuming you can work in isolation. I mean, the textbook example is a great one, right? And, and you know, where, you, where the problems are complex, um, you know, typically we see the, the greatest promise of impact coming from deep collaborative work. And certainly we're known for our collective impact framework as one approach to collaborative work. There are many um, that are effective. And I think really being willing to enter into uh, that messy process and working, in, and again, it's, it's in very, you know, sort of deep ways on a shared strategy for um, achieving a set of goals and a set of metrics that we tracked across the partners along the way, figuring out what is the, the sort of set of activities that all need to be combined uh, to potentially bring about that change, determining the best ways for those groups to communicate and work with each other, and then ideally having someone dedicated to the facilitation of that effort, um, you know, are kind of the five, five pieces of, of our framework that um, you know, we've, we've seen some success with. But I think it is a common pitfall to think there's, you know, kind of these, these big complex problems um, can really be solved with a lot of isolated action. Isolated action certainly can drive um, some degree of impact. Uh, but, you know, I, I really hear people in the field, you know, frustrated that we aren't seeing the impact coming more quickly uh, or at scale. And um, certainly our, our experience in working with collaborative efforts would suggest that's one way uh, to perhaps avoid mistakes from the past. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Laura. And Anna, when looking to scale up a program, how do you demonstrate a proof of concept to prospective new collaborators or partners? For example, what strategies enable you to develop long-term partnerships with 35 colleges? Um, yeah, um, great, great question. And this, this does sort of connect to the piece that I was describing earlier. We were, we were really as an organization because we had 12 years of running our original model, which was, a, like I said, a small residential summer program. We worked really closely with the students and it was a small number. And so, but we, because um, of the success of the model, 80% or so of our students got into tremendous colleges. Actually, 100% of them got into great colleges, uh, but around 80% of them ended up going to, you know, um, the top five or something like that, and we um, have thousands of applicants already who applied to our little program, and so we could approach our new partners who had never heard of us before with and um, and and with our track record that we had had. So again, I, I almost think of our leadership program, our small residential model, as like a big for 12 years, but but. Um, uh, it's really sort of showing early success um, and having real stories. So, you know, another theme that, that we've learned at QuestBridge, both in terms of bringing on new partnerships as well as, um, you know, getting support for what we're doing, is really putting the students in front and, and sharing their stories and how exceptional they are because that's really what's so compelling. Um, in terms of hold, keeping the partnerships and really sort of... Um, over time, we, as many people have said, we try to be really open and listen to what our partners are saying, what they're, um, what they're looking for in terms of um, what their pain points are, supportive, and actually every year we do a round of one of our partner schools just to see how this year went for them. And then, of course, we have multiple touch points throughout the, throughout the year, but um, I think being very open and trying to be as responsive as possible. Um, to our partners um, will, you know, sort of leads to kind of a, a long-term relationship with them. But again, always remembering and first because the way that yeah, I know the partner colleges 
um, you know, our, our own care about these students as well. So if we continue to meet on that, it sort of keeps us both um, energized and, and going in this partnership. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. And Shin, what is the best way to coordinate effective collaborations with international partners? Um, sure. Uh, you know, I, I think a common framework is, is really helpful, and I'm going to take liberty to interpret the question a little bit, um, really citing international partners, a large part of the collaborators that we work with and partners that work, we work with, the, the main ones tend to be the public sector, so they tend to be leaders uh, within ministries of health within all the countries that we work in. Um, and when the, I ever I see the word effective, I always think of health system strengthening. Um, you know, everything we do... While we all are a medical and social justice organization, everything we do really comes under that framework of how do we really strengthen the underlying healthcare system that will provide a sustainable level of healthcare that will always be there and that can always be improved on and can support a number of these sort of underlying systems and quality and data questions that are being brought up right now. Um, so I think that common framework of understanding that we are coming to the table with the public sector, not necessarily to do these little isolated projects, sort of what Laura was really alluding to, but really um, bringing ideas and programs that are really meant to strengthen and strengthening an underlying system that is meant to be sustainable and that is ubiquitous within an entire country. So we're, we're looking to really add on to the infrastructure of healthcare delivery that exists in a lot of these poor countries, knowing that there is a general underlying agreement that health system strengthening truly is the most effective way to deliver any level of health care across the board. Um, I, I think for us has probably been the biggest help for us in terms of convincing folks uh, to go in with very innovative projects such as a lot of our mental health work that we're currently doing um, most prominently in Haiti and Rwanda, but we'll also be building up in Lesotho, Malawi, Mexico, and Russia. Um, because again, when we have these conversations with ministries of health and we talk to them, they realize we're not just there to sort of try out a new gimmick or try out a, a new tool without really understanding that we're also there to build up the healthcare system, that we're actually investing in the doctors and the nurses, not only in doing many trainings, but providing ongoing supervision of helping really support their underlying supply chain of being able to help them understand how to create um, you know, much stronger systems of quality um, and of finance. And I think these are the reasons why our uh, collaborations with the ministries of health have been so effective um, because they're not, we're not just coming to them to say, uh, this is what we have to bring to the table, this is what we can do, but it's really a collaborative conversation to say, okay, how exactly can we work together to really build up the system that will be the, the cornerstone, not only of your healthcare uh, delivery system, but really for the economic development of your entire country. Um, so that has been really our strongest means of uh, coordinating and collaborating together with our international partners, particularly ministers. Fantastic, thank you, Shin. And Dean, what steps should always be applied to ensure responsible engagement with local communities? That is a great question. It's one that um, I, <laughs> I rail about all the time. I think, um, as we said, or as many folks alluded to earlier, we all have a tendency out of a desire to be helpful to um, be like bulls in a china shop, or rush into a, a community with the answers that we have or the tools that we've learned, the training that we've gotten from our various universities, et cetera, or the models that we've developed from our consulting firms or our businesses or what have you, and just sort of plop them down on people. And I, uh, I think I learned from so many years as a lawyer with indigenous communities around the world that that just doesn't work. The, um, uh, well, let me make four or five points. The first is don't rush. I think that we're really making a mistake with this new mantra that's developed in the last decade of scale it or it's not worthwhile. I just totally disagree with that kind of Stanford mantra. Um, if you help 20 people or 2,000 people, are you a better person? What's the difference? You know, it's effectiveness and integrity and intentionality, not how many people participate. I really disagree with that. In any event, don't rush. I think the rush to scale is probably the most destructive force in 
uh, social enterprise, whether it's for health or anything else. And if you look in the, the graveyard of, of dead and discarded development programs, which equal probably about 95% of them out there in history, that may be one of the biggest reasons for uh, lack of effectiveness. So don't rush. Scale can come later. I, my, my belief is ecological. If you do good work, growth will come. If growth is a goal, people cut corners, they cut quality, they cut salaries, whatever they got to do to meet that growth metric. I think that's an ass-backwards way of doing any kind of work, whether it's development, activism, or family building. Um, secondly, radical transparency. I believe that if you, it's really essential to build up trust with folks in communities you're trying to work in. And that can only be accomplished if, if people really know who you are, know what you're doing, understand what you're doing. Otherwise, the rumor mill grows. People make all sorts of assumptions about you, and, and it kicks into all sorts of pre-existing hierarchies and oppressions that are in many of the communities in the world. And so unless you're really clear and really transparent about who you are, what funding you're bringing in, what your expectations are, um, it can cause a lot of problems. So I'll throw that one in there, radical transparency. Um, be careful about promising. It's, it's not only the word promise or saying, you know, being careful not to promise, but understand that people who are, um, you know, this is a terrible sounding word, people in need for many, many reasons, um, hear things not maybe the way you say them. So if you come in and you're looking at setting up a health program, pretty much everything you say is considered a promise. So I think you have to be very, very conscious on the, the commitments you make, when you're, when you're, especially when you're trying to design a program in a community. Our programs generally take a year plus to design with the community because it's so essential to develop that trust, to understand the dynamics of the communities you're in, which for us is exclusively indigenous communities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and um, to set up that program in, in, in a way that's got a lot of integrity and, and people can rely on it. I could talk for a long time, but I'm going to stop right there so other people can jump in and we can get back to all these points later. Sure. Thank you, Dean. That's terrific. And Julie, what training and competencies do you find to be most important to ensure that visiting medical professionals engage effectively and responsibly with local healthcare systems? So, so that's a, a great question. We just finished our recruitment season for the third cohort of GHSP volunteers, so your, this question is very timely and certainly on the top of my head. Um, first of all, we, we look at uh, four or five key pieces uh, when looking at um, uh, a, a successful candidate. First of all, we're looking at uh, what is their clinical expertise? Um, is it a solid expertise and is it relevant uh, to the needs of our uh, academic institutions with which we partner? Um, uh, we also look at um, the ability to be effective um, uh, and expert educators, both in the classroom and the clinical setting. Um, our nursing volunteers, um, in particular, are teaching in bachelor's, master's, and even PhD programs in these countries. Um, and these institutions are really looking for experts in teaching and curriculum development. So. Um, most of our successful applicants have uh, a master's degree, and we've had several successful PhD applicants to really meet the needs um, of these growing nursing institutions. Um, and thirdly, um, and this addresses some of the, the, the sort of challenges that other people have addressed, is a background in global health um, um, experience. Um, the nurses and doctors who don't have solid experience working in limited resource settings developing cultural competence uh, will quickly become overwhelmed and may inadvertently upset those with whom they are working. Uh, many of our successful applicants are return Peace Corps volunteers. Um, their two-year experience really lends beautifully um, to this program. Um, so really looking to prevent that white savior um, sort of um, we can fix everything and change everything uh, perspective. Uh, it's having that global health experience, learning the lessons on the ground uh, is really, really essential um, to a successful um, um, engagement. 
Um, just two more pieces. First, uh, flexibility. Uh, certain, fl absolutely, um, things do not go as well as anticipated. Um, they need to be able to roll with the punches. Um, and the nurses and doctors working in these environments need to be okay with that. They need to be able to roll with the punches, um, adapt, and, and thrive uh, in these situations. And lastly, really, is just uh, very simply a readiness and excitement uh, to engage and learn and partner um, with their colleagues on the ground. So those are the key, um, key pieces there. Terrific. Thank you, Julie. And Rachel, how can small organizations and programs incorporate data collection and analysis into their daily work in order to assess effectiveness? Right. And this, I think it's important to fit uh, what you can do uh, to, you know, what's most effective for you as an organization. So what might be the right approach for a big, well-funded NGO is not what a small group should be doing. So you have to think about, you know, what's your capacity and what can you what can you collect that's going to be useful uh, at a reasonable cost? So we do randomized trials. We certainly don't say that everybody should do a randomized trial. So you have a trial you have to do, you know, you have to do it well for, to make that worthwhile. But there's usually some key pieces of information um, which you should be collecting and can collect and is going to be part of that feedback loop that we've been talking about. So let me give you some, you know, really basic examples. Take up is something which a lot of uh, is absolutely critical to uh, to many organizations. There's you know little point in doing doing a program or doing a social entrepreneurship um, activity if nobody buys the product or if nobody comes to the training or you know. and people often have not very good sense of the level of take up and that's sort of just like the bare minimum that you need to be tracking. Well the bare minimum is, you know, making sure that you do what you said you were going to do and we talked about promises and it's important to, you know, deliver on your promise. So if you you know, this is what I would call process monitoring. So if you say you're going to do an event, you've got to do it. You know, that's you've made that commitment. So you've got to be monitoring that. But that's kind of really ground zero data. I think the next level, which most organizations should be doing a better better job, and I actually include sort of big organizations in this, is just tracking take up. So when we started working with microcredit organizations and we asked them what's the take up of credit in your, you know, in the communities you work in, most of them said, oh, it's about 80%. Turns out in virtually no, none of the places that we've worked evaluating microcredit, is it anything like 80%? It's much closer to 20%. Well, that's a key piece of information that you ought to know. And it's not a sophisticated randomized trial um, that, that leads you to know that. It's just a bit of basic descriptive data. Um, so, so I think you know, if I had to say one simple thing, it would be try and get good measures of take up. Um, I, you know, obviously, though, it really depends on the organization, but you have to tailor your, you know, think carefully about where, what you have resources to do, what's going to be most useful to feeding back to, to improving your design and understanding whether what you're doing is useful. And then pick a few, a couple of things and do that well. Don't try and do something too ambitious in terms of data collection and measuring impact. Uh, and then not do it well. It's much better to pick a couple of key things and do those things well. Terrific. Thank you, Rachel. And one other question for you as well, Rachel. What is the best way to coordinate follow-up for evaluations and research? How do you combat common issues experienced during follow-up stages, such as change of contact information, low response rates, disinterest and disengagement, privacy violations, et cetera? Okay, so you mentioned a couple of different things. Um, I'll start with the follow-up. Um, if you're going to do an evaluation where you're going to follow people up over time, you need to think about that right at the beginning. So uh, you need to, so in the very first time you contact people, you can collect what we call a tracking module. And that says, if you were to move, where might you move to? If you moved, who would know where you are? 
uh, you know, collect phone numbers, collect numbers of people who, who are neighbors. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of information that you can let, collect when you talk to someone that if you move, it will then enable you to collect them. The other thing, I mean, there are other sort of bunch of tricks that, that, um, people who've done a lot of this will know about, but, and a lot of them are contact specific. So I've been tracking 80,000 girls in Bangladesh over uh, seven years now, and I've got a pretty high tracking rate. Uh, those girls are moving all over the country. They're working in garment factories. They're getting married. They're moving. Uh, the way we managed to get a high response rate the last time we went is partly we asked questions of their parents, um, and partly... We know that traditionally in Bangladesh, girls return to their parents' home at Eid. Um, you know, just like in the US, people return to their parents' home at Thanksgiving. Uh, I wouldn't want to show up on someone's day, you know, the day of Thanksgiving, but <laughs> what we did is we sent enumerators in the week of Eid. And a lot of those girls had returned. And we also did phone surveys for the ones that we couldn't reach, and we provided small incentives. So there, sort of, there's a whole toolkit of things, which again have to be context specific. You know, you have to know that Eid is the time that girls return in Bangladesh. Um, so that's one thing. You mentioned confidentiality and privacy, and that's something we take incredibly seriously, and anyone collecting data should. Um, if you make a commitment, again, it's about promises and keeping them. If you make a commitment that the data will be not made public, then, you know, you have to keep that. What What is the standard thing to do is to, you know, collect the data, but then when you publish it, you don't, you anonymize it first. Um, and you have to be careful. We, you know, the whole set of protocols about what de what information you have to take out before you make it public. Um, and think about, again, this is culturally contextual what is sensitive so some things might be sensitive in one cultural context that are not in other contexts um, but the basic uh, thing is to um, as soon as possible take someone's name off it so if you're writing a survey you have the name on the front you literally write it so that anything that could identify the person is on the front page as soon as you've done the survey you rip that page off but you have an ID code that runs through the entire survey if you're collecting on a tablet, you make sure that that's encrypted. You know, everything we put on, uh, whenever we collect data, all our computers are encrypted so that people can't get the data. So it's quite a complicated story about how to preserve privacy, but there are a lot of um, standard protocols that, that p if you're going to do this, you need to make sure that you know those protocols. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel. And Chin, for those who are interested in being innovators or entrepreneurs, what guidance do you have regarding responsible innovation and responsible entrepreneurship? Absolutely. Um, you know, I really appreciate a lot of the examples that Rachel given about the books and Laura talking about working, uh, talking about things working in isolation. Um, you know, when, whenever I look at new entrepreneurs and some of the the gadgets and some of the hacks that they've done, um, whenever I look at new programs and innovations, um, I, they're, they're seem to be missing the point about what it means to be patient-centered um, or customer-centered or however you want to really frame it. Um, but this idea for me of being patient-centered really goes down to the fact that if you were a sick patient um, and you ideally knew everything that there was to know about healthcare delivery, if you knew, uh, had all the education, knew all the ins and outs, knew all the various providers and, and what it really took for you to get healthcare however you wanted it, whenever you wanted it, wherever you wanted it, um, what would that actually look like? What would the patient want? And for me, that's patient-centered. Um, patient-centered isn't just about having an outcome to say, at this one point in time, a patient is better. Um, it's not at one point in time to say, oh, well, we've, we've trained X number of physicians or X number of nurses to be able to provide depression care. Um, that's really a, a small piece of the pie and a small piece of the puzzle that is sort of severely limiting and speaks to a, a very sort of siloed and one-sided view of, of how we do global health, how we do global development generally. Um, so for me, when I, when I think about responsible um, innovation, responsible entrepreneurship, it really, for me, comes down to this ideal of, of what it means to be patient-centered. Um, so just, just to give an example, when we do a lot of our work 
um, at Partners in Health uh, with mental health, particularly in places like Haiti and Rwanda. Um, you know, we're, we're obviously asking a lot of questions about making sure that we're engaging with various stakeholders, various clinicians, um, local leaders, patients, et cetera. Um, we're also making sure that, you know, how, how diseases, how mental illness is really framed is within a culturally appropriate viewpoint. Um, we're making sure that we're going out and doing psychoeducation work. But again, we're also thinking about all of the, not only training those who uh, will be delivering the types of care, but also making sure that every single person that we train reaches competency that would be required to run the entire program on its own. So that's making sure that general physicians completely understand how to be able to safely provide psychiatric medication. Um, that's making sure that there is a, a fully staff program manager there that knows the ins and outs of finance and program management and person management um, and crisis management and being able to deal with day-to-day -day operational issues that may go outside the bounds of the log frame. Um, that's making sure that we have community nurses that are very connected to community health workers, knowing that they understand what it means to appropriately compensate community health workers based off of their performance and also helping community health workers understand what it means to be uh, an appropriate uh, mental health provider within the community. So when we, when we think about, again, and I speak back to the systems framework and this health systems approach, we're not just thinking about disease, we're not just thinking about training, we're not just thinking about evaluation, um, but we are thinking about how we contextualize outcomes and how we are contextualizing systems and that how we really define ourselves, how we define successful, responsible innovation and entrepreneurship is really looking towards some of the root causes of illness, really looking at the root causes of what causes system failures and really thinking about sustainability in the long term once a research project is over, once a grant is done. When there are no more resources left, or do we still have the underlying system in place to be able to ensure that all the outcomes, all the measures that we promised and really at the very beginning of the talk to be able to understand, you know, what does it truly mean to be able to provide someone uh, like a long-lasting good health across the, the spectrum of their life? Um, this is how we're thinking about things. So when I think about responsible innovation and entrepreneurship, that's what I think about, is really thinking about the, the true definition of patient-centeredness, how we can do that both in the short and long term. Wonderful. Thank you, Shin. And Laura, there are many unique and innovative ideas that are constantly being pitched and at times developed into programs. What is the best way to ensure from the onset that an idea can develop into an effective outcomes-based program? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, I know we're nearly at the top of the hour, but, uh, you know, at the risk of um, – at the risk of stating the obvious, I mean, I think funding is a big one, right? We haven't talked much about that. Um, and I think, you know, funding buys a lot of flexibility, right? And so ensuring that work that, you know, you want to undertake sort of fits within a broader framework of priorities of funders, whether they're um, the, the governments, the government funders in the countries you're working, or whether they're the bilateral funders who are working from those local missions, um, I think, you know, there are just a lot, of, um, a lot of benefits, obviously. It's how you get the right team, right, so you can make sure that you've got folks with the right sensitivities, the right experiences. It's what allows you to make mistakes and course correct um, and not be out of business. And, you know, obviously it's a signal and endorsement of the expertise of the funders that might be supporting you um, as another layer of advisors, perhaps. Um, so uh, we haven't we haven't talked about that yet, but certainly that's that's one of the big things for for, for getting from kind of a conceptual and innovation stage up to um, you know any kind of program that's achieving a degree of impact, and then you know if scale is in the equation, you know being able to go from there. Thank you, Laura. And for our final question for Dean. What strategies from the for-profit sector do you find to be useful for the nonprofit sector? And similarly, what nonprofit strategies should be applied to the for-profit sector? Well, that's a one-hour comment. I'll, I'll keep it very, very short. Um, the most effective for-profit for, for strategy or concern is efficiency. Efficiency not only of your operation, uh, of your project, but efficiency of your organization. I find that um, so many organizations are so bloated um, with personnel they don't need or salaries that are off the charts. It's hard for me to – I was once offered a, an ungodly amount of money to run a, a refugee camp in Chiapas, 
and I, I turned it down because they were just it was the UN and they were just offering too much money and too many benefits. I find that reprehensible. So efficiency is really, really important, um, and it makes a little money go a long way. On the other side of the equation, holding people accountable on both ends, holding our people accountable for doing what they're supposed to do and, and being pretty hard, because this is serious stuff. You're not, you're not selling laundry detergent. You know, we're dealing with people's lives, livelihoods, and futures, and self-esteem, because a failed development program kicks people in the teeth and people have a sense of their own failure if something went, goes wrong, not just, oh, that NGO left, but there's something internal that says we did something wrong. And, and that's really important to avoid that. So holding people accountable on our end, also holding people accountable on our partners' end, because we too often give uh, people in our programs too much slack. And, you know, if you're not doing the job or there's a little suspicion about your intention or the way you're treating people, I know a lot of men in India who smack people around. It's quite seriously, I'm dealing with that right now in a project. Um, it's just not acceptable, and people have to be held to a standard on both sides. You, people don't get a buy because they're poor, you know, or because they're well-intentioned. I think it's really important to hold ourselves and our partners uh, accountable. I'll leave it at that. Terrific. Thank you, Dean. And thank you so much to all of our phenomenal panelists today and for all of the insight and expertise that you've shared with the audience. This now concludes today's webinar. Thank you.